Okay, so to give you a picture of um, gun violence in the United States and in uh, Massachusetts, we wanted to share some statistics. So according to, and I'm gonna share all of this, I will share the slides, we'll share the recording, the slides and plenty of resources um, following this event and make sure you have all of them. Um, so no need to take notes or worry, we're gonna provide all the information for you. So according to the Gun Violence Archive, there are 38,000 deaths nationwide annually. And already, um, as I was working on these slides, there are 30,973 deaths from firearms. So in Massachusetts in 2019, we had 247 gun deaths, which is about five deaths per week. 57% are suicides, 38% are homicides. A black person in Massachusetts is 15 times more likely to die from a gun homicide than a white person compared to 10 times nationally. And several cities had a more than 50% increase in gun violence in 2020. In New Bedford, 237% increase. Boston had an increase of 58% fatal and 33% non-fatal. Worcester was 53% and Springfield is 60%. And I know that the legislators like to ground their policy and data. Good data drives good policy, as we'll mention again later. However, I want to remind everyone that for every data point is someone's family member, brother, sister, you know, sibling, parent, friend, neighbor. And so these are all people that live in our community who are affected. And for every person shot, whether fatally or non-fatally, nine people suffer from trauma of that shooting. And that trauma has a ripple effect. So as Rep Liz Miranda likes to say, we can get to zero. And unfortunately there's a misconception not only in the legislature, but elsewhere that, you know, Massachusetts nationwide has a very low percentage of gun deaths. So we look like the model state and we do have an amazing set of comprehensive gun safety laws, but there's always more we need to do and we should do and we can do because even one is too many. And so Rep Miranda says we can get to zero and, and we need to do that. So we cannot rest on our laurels. I'm sure you all heard last week to make a plane, fatal shooting, broad daylight. It's, it's constant and none of our neighbors should be living in the fear of gun violence. So today we're gonna cover three bills that the league supports and we're working on. And those are um, an act relative to 3D printed weapons and ghost guns, um, an act to create alternatives com for community education services, the ACEs, and an act relative to crime gun data recording and analysis. So I'll go into more detail in each of these three. So first we're gonna talk about ghost guns and just to give you a sense of what they are, um, ghost guns are kits basically purchased online and they are called 80% receivers. So when you receive it in the mail, or you purchase it in a, gun, a brick and mortar store, or you go to a gun show and purchase it, it's basically an 80% receiver and the person builds the remaining 20% at home. Um, primarily these are purchased internationally and online. And um, a 3D gun is made at home using a 3D printer. It's a type of ghost gun, but it's made at home using a 3D printer. The blueprints are posted online and they're unsafe to the user because plastic can explode. So um, they lack serial numbers is the main problem. Um, so it these ghost guns and 3D printed guns circumvent the licensing process. So there's no background check and they're untraceable by law enforcement. So ghost guns at the federal level um, you may have heard in the news after Biden, President Biden made his announcements about curbing gun violence, that there would be a federal rules change. Um, and Attorney General Garland issued the rules change in May. And 
it was part of the federal register. Um, so it requires the rule that they printed would require a background check before selling a kit, ghost gun kit. It would classify the 80% receiver as a firearm. So it would be subject to firearms laws. And it would require a serial number on the ghost guns and 3D printed guns. And you can read the complete rule here. Um, I'll give you the I'll give you the links as well. Um, the public comment period closed on August 19th. And Attorney General Healy filed comment with 17 other attorneys general supporting the rule change. And we do expect court challenges. Um, according to a contact at the Givers Law Center, David Pusino, who is a staff attorney there, he expects the rule to um, be final before the end of the year. So by December and hopefully, but we do expect court challenges. So um, that's why we do want to support a ghost gun bill at the state level, because as we know, with so many of the league supported bills, um, with the absence of action at the federal level, we need to take action at the state level. So in, from 2016 to 2020, more than 23,000 unserialized firearms were recovered in connection with 325 homicides or attempted homicides. The Giffords Law Center reports 30% of all guns recovered by the ATF in California are unserialized. So that's almost a third of guns recovered in California do not have a serial number. Um, the Philadelphia Police Department recovered 287 ghost guns in the first half of this year. And they, it's really grown exponentially. So in 2019, only 95. And now this year, first half, six months, 287. Um, so we definitely know there are reports of ghost guns used in Massachusetts. Um, if you Google it, you'll see the news reports of um, sting operations that uncover a large amount of ghost guns, um, usually tied to white supremacy. Some sort of white supremacist manifesto is usually found within the stash of ghost guns. They were used in the plot to kill Governor Gretchen Whitmer. They were used in the January 6th insurrection. And currently eight states restrict ghost guns, California, Connecticut, Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Washington State, and the District of Columbia. So for the state bill, um, H2491, S1540, an act relative to 3D printed weapons and ghost guns, it was filed by David Linsky and um, Senator Barrett. It was drafted by DA Marion Ryan, actually. She's one of the filers. She's not a petitioner because she's not a legislator, but she asked them to file it on her behalf because she sees a drastic increase in ghost guns and it is a problem. Um, she detailed the operations to us in one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, she noted how even the 3D printed guns are an issue with teenagers building them at home and so forth. So this would classify 3D printed guns and ghost guns without serial numbers as being illegal. So it would require them to have a serial number and have metal versus plastic. Um, with the ghost guns, you know, they can get through those metal detectors because there is no metal in them. So the ask, we are asking for a hearing right now. So as you know, in the legislative process, every bill has to have a hearing before February deadline. I'm not sure the exact date, but before February, they do, every bill has to have a hearing. And so we're, this bill has been referred to the Joint Committee on Judiciary. So the current ask of their legislators is to have a hearing. Okay, so before, I'm gonna stop share for a second and see if people have questions about ghost guns before I go on to the next topic. So if anyone has ghost guns, we can look in the chat or um, if you'd like to raise your hand and come off mute. Jan, I think you have a question. Yeah, I'm curious about, uh, you might not have this data, but do you know if younger people are more likely to get ghost guns than other age groups? I have heard anecdotally that um, unlicensed firearms dealers are trying to sell ghost guns in Boston to younger people um, out of the back of their trunks, but I have no hard and fast data. It's just anecdotal evidence. Just, just a note, I, um, I just saw data that showed that an amazing rise in suicide rates among young black girls, 12 to 14, mm. and boys. And I'm wondering if there might be a connection. Wow, okay, thank you for that, Jan. Okay. 
Is the ammunition the same for ghost guns? That is an excellent question. I believe yes, but I can take down that question and make sure I get an answer to you. If I'm missing you, just feel free to let me know. Okay, so now I'm gonna be going on to the topic of um, police shootings. So let me go back to share my slides. Great, so the next topic, unfortunately, is um, police shooting. So you may have seen a comprehensive database in the Washington Post where from 2000, 15 to present, the Washington Post has cataloged every single police shooting nationwide. And from 2015 to 2020, more than 5,000 such shootings have occurred. Um, there have been 938 year to date this year. You may have read in the news or seen on the news about the um, police involved shootings in Saugus in August and in Newton in January. And typically these shootings involve people um, who are undergoing a mental health crisis at the time. You may have also heard of a program called um, CAHOOTS which is crisis assistance helping out in the streets. And a CAHOOTS program was launched in Eugene, Oregon 31 years ago, and it's pretty much a national model. It's a, the, this gold standard um, in reducing police shootings and revolve in, in you know, responding um, with clinicians to um, 911 calls. So the calls are routed to a peer um, rather than the police. And this will decrease, um, decrease police shootings, unintended shootings. So non-police response programs, uh, Eugene, Oregon, I mentioned, Olympia, Washington, and Denver. They've also been launched in Austin, San Francisco, Albuquerque, Portland, and Rochester. You may have read also in the news that Lynn, the cities of Lynn and Boston have launched crisis response teams and Springfield has a lot of money towards creating one. So um, the bill that we want to discuss is H2519 S1552, an act to create alternatives for community education services, the ACEs bill. And it's by Rep Sabadosa and Senator Sonia Chang Diaz. And it's basically a grant program administered by Health and Human Services to establish non-law enforcement, unarmed, community-based response options for calls to 911. And it's geared toward the most over-policed communities, in Boston, Brockton, New Bedford, Worcester, Springfield, Lowell, and others. And it could be funded by um, Medicaid funds and the American Rescue Plan. Other cities and towns nationwide are utilizing the Medicaid funding and the ARP to fund these these new programs. And as I mentioned, it's based on the CAHOOTS model. Um, this is a federal bill as well. Um, this is a federal bill as well by Representative Karen Bass, um, which was the model. So we did have a hearing for ACES. It was on July 14th before the Joint Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security. Um, we have our testimony, which we can share with you. It's on our website. and. The links are here and our current ask, we want the bill to be reported out of committee favorably. So after it's hearing, the bills will be reported out of committee. We want a favorable report. So it moves to the next stage of the legislative process. Okay. I'm gonna stop share for a second and see if anyone has questions about ACEs. I'll check in the chat. Taylor, I'm sorry, I can't see the whole chat right now. Are there any questions about ACEs that I could answer in there? There are not right now. Okay, great, thank you. Great, okay, so we'll go to the next bill. Okay, the next bill we wanted to talk about is actually was actually filed last session as well and the league supported it. Um, I mentioned how good data informs good policy. Um, so as you know, Massachusetts has amazing comprehensive gun safety laws uh, enacted in 2014 
thanks to many of the activists and advocates on this screen. So thank you for your work. Um, but we do need to decide how to move forward on gun laws. And in order to do that, we need to have accurate data reporting. Um, so this bill by um, Representative Marjorie Decker and Senator Cindy Cream, who also filed it last session, um, would determine, it basically establishes a formal mechanism to require the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to supply data to a local university researcher for analysis. So what the point of the bill is, is we're trying to determine how and where crime guns originate and what Massachusetts can do to stem the tide of illegal guns. So 50% of guns used in crime originate in Massachusetts. So, you know, how, how are they, at one point they were legal, so how are they becoming illegal? So where are they coming from? Are they coming from multiple handgun sales? Are they coming from bad apple dealers and so forth? So we, we have a ton of data because every gun recovered in crime has to um, be reported to EOP, so we're trying to determine that path in order to determine the next steps of gun laws in Massachusetts. Like what else do we need to do here? Um, so right now we're asking for a hearing on this bill in the Joint Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security. Okay, so um, you may have heard on the other Meet the Specialist events that it's really important to work in coalition with other organizations. And the coalition that we work with is the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. And they were instrumental to passage of the 2014 Comprehensive um, Gun Law and ERPA, which is Extreme Risk Protection Order in 2018. And there are 120 member orgs in that coalition working to eradicate gun violence in Massachusetts. They take a holistic approach to prevention by addressing the root causes of gun violence. And there are several bills that they support. In addition, um, they support the ACEs bill. They support um, the raise the age, expungement, diversion bills. Um, you may have heard about those bills in the Meet the Specialist criminal justice presentation. So for effective advocacy and Again, I'll share the links um, to presentations that we have on effective advocacy, um, but emails are best during COVID. Um, that's what we hear from staffers all the time. Emails are best during COVID. The state house is still closed. We're not sure when it will reopen. Um, so you wanna include the bill number, the title of the bill, your name and your complete address to your legislator. And personal stories really make an impression. That seems to be what moves the needle. Why is this issue important to you? Um, what matters to you? And your ask about the bill is related to a specific stage in the process. So for example, we request a hearing on this bill or we request that you vote this bill out of committee favorably. But those seem to be um, the nuts and bolts of effective advocacy when you're contacting your legislator. So in addition, so again, thanks to all the amazing advocates who are on this call today. Here we are at the bill signing of ERPO, Extreme Risk Protection Order in 2018. Um, it was a great day. So thanks to all of your hard work on that. But in addition to pushing for new laws, we also have to push about awareness and implementation of the laws. So that's why I have this here. So, Massachusetts Extreme Risk Protection Order um, is not a well-known law. People don't know how to access it. And what that means is it's a civil procedure where someone can petition to have guns removed from a loved one's home during a crisis. So it's a civil procedure to just keep everyone safe. So you wanna keep people safe for experiencing mental health issues, safe from themselves and others safe as well if there are guns in the home. So I wanted to share this website with you, which is maerpo.org in hopes that you would share it to folks that you know to just get the word out because we worked so hard to get this bill passed in 2018, but people just don't know how to access ERPO and I'm hoping you wouldn't mind spreading the word. Okay, and for resources, we wanted to share these links. Um, the bills that the League supports for this session can be found on our website. We have a webinar meeting 
recorded on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, how the legislature works featuring Beacon Block is really insightful. Um, we have the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts Citizen Lobbyist Handbook, which gives you tips and tricks on how to work with your legislators. I also wanted to share the information about statistics from the Gun Violence Archive, Every Town, um, the information from Giffords on Ghost Guns, more info on the CAHOOTS model, and the Washington Post links with all the information on police shootings. And if anyone is not on my email list um, to get occasional updates for ways you can advocate to pass these bills, please email me. And then I'm happy to take some questions. So I'll stop my share. So those are the three bills and where they stand and what steps we need to take. And I'm happy to take your questions. Oh, great question, Nan. Nan said, asks, do all bills get a hearing? Yes, every bill filed in the legislature, which is close to 7,000 bills, I think this session has to have a hearing. Um, it's required. So every bill has to have a public hearing about, I think I was hearing, I think Kathy Leonardson, one of our legislative directors mentioned about a third of our specific bills have been heard. So that means two thirds, <laughs> two thirds of the bills still have to have hearings. So I expect I heard a uh, word on the street is that judiciary will be having hearings every Tuesday, <clears throat> pardon me, every Tuesday for the next several months. So I think it's gonna be a really busy October. Yes, so we're gonna be asking, what you wanna do is, um, you want to contact your legislator um, and let them know that you want the bill to have a hearing. But yes, Dan, do you want, can, can I be more specific in your question maybe? Uh, would it help to contact the various members of the committee, even if they're not, even if we're not their constituents? It definitely helps after the bill has had a hearing because you want the committee to know this is an important issue to you. Um, so for example, if the bill has already been heard in committee, um, you can definitely contact those committee members and we can give you a sample of how that works. Usually you can copy and paste all their email addresses into one and copy your personal legislator. And so that your personal legislator knows as well if they're not on that committee. Um, but it's usually they want legislators want to hear from their constituents, but in the case where it's already had a hearing and you want to, that bill, you want the committee members to know people care about this bill. This is important to a lot of people. Then it's okay to contact the committee members and just CC your personal legislator. And then how to interact during the hearing. I mean, or how to uh, take the opportunity to give your opinion at hearing time. During yeah, the remote all, hearings, I mean, all, yeah, or yeah. whether whatever they are, yeah. So the the remote hearings definitely can be tricky because they can last a few hours. Um, so I suggest um, when you know about those hearings, and we can keep you updated on when those hearings take place. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't have a lot of notice about when the hearings are, as we know. Um, sometimes they say that the hearing is being held, and these bills are going to be heard and then that bill doesn't doesn't make it so we'll do our best to communicate that information to you um, I think but during the remote hearings it's really important to send written testimony and when the hearing is announced it's very clear on the website the malegislature.gov website they'll have a hearing announcement and it'll say submit te written testimony to, and it'll give specific staffers for that committee to submit the written testimony. You can also watch, you can um, work with a coalition or other organization to just publicly get the word out. I noticed that the MA legislature is really focused on Twitter. So if you have a Twitter account or a way to amplify that Twitter message that yes, this is a hugely important issue to you and very important to you. They seem, the legislators really seem to follow that as well. Um, but so, so submit written testimony. You can also watch the hearing. You don't necessarily have to um, participate, but if you would like to give oral testimony, you are welcome to sign up to give oral testimony. Um, there is usually a spreadsheet, you know, sign up page to this. It's usually the same person running the oral testimony that's running the written testimony. So. They'll give you specific guidelines by committee when the hearing is announced.
Okay, so let's see um, if I can see some questions in the chat. Well, that's a really good question. So Petra asks, what is the difference between the CAHOOTS model and the best response team? I have heard of the best response team. Um, and that is something I can definitely research and, and make folks aware of. I've heard that the best response team um, doesn't always have all the resources it needs, and it can take some time um, for folks to receive a response. Um, but that's just local anecdotal um, evidence that I have, but I can find out more about the differences between CAHOOTS and BEST. That's an excellent question. I think CAHOOTS also handles things with housing and other issues in addition to mental health response. Do we on, oh, sorry, uh, go just ahead. While you're on CAHOOTS, there was an earlier question that may have passed you by. How okay. effective is the CAHOOTS model? How effective is the CAHOOTS model? It's actually very effective, and I'm sorry I didn't print out the exact data, but I can include that in my follow-up email to you. It's actually very effective, um, and I'm sorry I can't recall the exact data off the top of my head, but um, I'm happy to follow up with an email on that. Um, do we know what reps take money from the NRA or gun manufacturers? I'm not sure. I see that all the time at the federal level, but I'm not sure. Um, does anyone else know the answer to that? Do we know what reps take money from the NRA? That's a really great question. We should find out. Okay, Rusty, excellent question. Let's see, gun Jim, safety. Jim, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yep. Jim, the Office of Campaign and Political Finance lists where people's money comes from during campaigns. Right. So you can go there and look up your rep and see. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you, Nancy. Do folks know how to access that? Nancy, do you know the website? Uh, OCPF dot maybe org. <laughs> it's dot us. I put it in the chat. Um, oh, thank you. And Taylor. I put like the index of filers. So you just, um, if you click the link I gave you, you can just search for uh, your rep's name um, and it should come up with their campaign contributors. Thank you. That's awesome. Another excellent question. Gun safety advocates are sometimes portrayed as anti second amendment. It's not always the case. Do you have suggestions for countering this and support a more nuanced discussion? That is an excellent question. And I think what I've learned has been successful is framing it within a public health perspective and a public health discussion. Nobody wants an accidental shooting. Nobody wants a child to pick up an unstored, unsecured gun in a home and die. So I think focusing on we want everyone to be as safe as possible, and we don't want any unintended deaths is a good place to start. Um, I know that um, the CDC head, Rochelle Walensky, was talking a lot about that recently and just framing everything in a public health perspective. And that was her philosophy um, and trying to work with um, pro Second Amendment folks. Does anyone else have ideas about that? A great question, Colleen asks. A few years, um, let's see. A few years back, there was a controversy about Maura Healy, maybe an automatic or semi-automatic weapons. Do you remember that debate? I'm not. Does anyone else know about that? I'm not sure, but I can research and find out. She okay, was giving, it, she was giving a clearer definition of the weapons that were. Um, not allowed that were banned okay um, so and i think that she actually well no i'll stop there okay okay we will research tbd um is there any opposition or support from police unions and chiefs about these bills um not that we know of and actually what's um very promising especially with the aces bill um is that there are many former police, actually, I think it's Rep Zaros um, down the Cape, who also filed a similar bill about social worker response to 911 calls. There are actually five bills on the same topic area. And I think police 
welcome um, the clinician response to 911 calls because they're not trained in that area. And it's a heavy burden for them to lift if you're not trained, especially. So as far as we know, um, no opposition um, from police unions and chiefs about these bills. And they're actually really asking for the ghost guns for sure, because they need help with that too, with so many being recovered. Okay, any other questions or Taylor, am I missing anything in the chat? Um, I am not seeing anything else. I think you might have gotten everything. Great. Okay, great. Does it, if anyone has anything else they'd like to ask, feel free to come off mute or raise your hand. Okay, great. There, so will there be an action alert sent on this after this or? Um, there aren't, no, we are not gonna do an action alert on this actually. But you'll be sending us copies, as you said, copies of your uh, of your slides so we can yes. refer to them. That Definitely. Would be that would be Definitely. great for a follow up because I'm on the Cape for, you know, Rep Zaros and I'm gonna let some yes. people know to get in touch with him. Oh, that would be great. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a question. Sure. So do, is there something like that we can post to either our uh, league page or our, um, <clears throat> just our own personal Facebook pages or other social media that lists these bills and says, you know, if you're worried about these issues, you should support them and contact your representatives. Is there something prepared to push out or oh sure I can I can definitely prepare something that would be excellent thank you that would be amazing right mm -hmm. yeah I had heard I didn't realize the ghost guns were so big I mean I'd heard about them but I didn't mm -hmm. realize it gotten to the point where they could be produced mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and were so widespread definitely and actually in Pennsylvania um, cert well, certain states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, others, you know, they banned them, but they're still like, it's online. And so it just goes deeper into the dark web where, you know, it's international companies shipping them. And then I know in Pennsylvania, the, um, the attorney general there got gun shows to say officially, we will not sell kits anymore. We are not selling those gun kits. Um, so that was a big win in Pennsylvania. But again, it's 49 other states also. Right? So, um, but that was a big win. I know that attorney general's working really hard. New Jersey attorney general's working really hard. Great, thank you. Okay, any last questions? Great, well, thank every, I thank you so much for all your dedication and advocacy and work. And it's so great to see everyone. And I'll be sure I'll answer these questions in a follow-up email. Thank you.